to live from the yard here in North Fayette and Robinson. It is the Andy Tool Radio Show. And I'm Chris Shuffling, the play-by-play -play voice of Robert Morris Colony. It's good to have you with us tonight. And a nice crowd here at the yard. A funny thing happened on the way to the yard last week. We couldn't find the coach anywhere. I knew where I was. I was in Florida. I knew where I was. Well, that, okay. You know, recruiting sometimes gets in the way of uh, coaching shows. And unfortunately, we were unable to uh, reschedule a recruiting commitment that we had made. We had an uh, opportunity to go down and, and uh, visit with a, a recruit's family and, and parents and uh, try to, a couple different ways to be able to move it, but we're unable to. And I know, Shove, you were thrown for a little bit of a loop. I think Matt O'Brien heard the, the uh, you know, the uh, little frustration in that. The wrath of the voice of the Columbus. And I'll be honest, you know, Jimmy and Trey, I know they filled in for me last week. I got some questionable reviews from some people that were listening, um, you know, not, not here live, but uh, listening at home. And uh, they thought they were solid, but, you know, maybe could have been a little bit better. Oh! See, those guys, they have radio fever now. And they were telling me after the show during the week leading up to the, the past weekend of games that uh, they, they kind of have a fever. They want to do their own radio shows. They do. Right? Am, I, am I going to get Wally Pitt? Is that, is that what happened? No, I'll, be, I'll be good. But, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I was, um, you know, Jimmy didn't seem as enthusiastic. Trey, I think, likes his experience. I think he's not, he's not afraid to, uh, you know, have his opinions on some things and, and talk. So... I'm sure both of those guys are fine. All kidding aside, um, the recruiting trip obviously went successfully from what I understand. And I know you can't talk too much about things like that at this point of the season, but uh, did you bag your guy? Uh, well, again, we can't, we can't discuss any particulars of anything, but it was, uh, it was a very positive trip. And we're excited about the result of it, and uh, hopefully our fans will be excited about the result of it in the future. All right, that sounds good. And we are uh, here at the yard in uh, North Payette and Robinson. It's a great new place. It's only been here for a couple months. The yard, of course, uh, has different locations around Pittsburgh, but we're fortunate to have one out here in the area of Robert Marsh University's campus. And Coach, uh, uh, you know, you walked in here tonight, and uh, I know your eyes uh, lit up because this is a fabulous venue. Yeah, it's a great spot. I've been to one in Market Square. I've been to one in uh, the Galleria before. Uh, and so, you know, I'm understanding what, what I've been walking into, but they've done a great, great job with this space. Uh, and, and this area over here, you know, really hasn't had anything for, for a little while. So I think this should become a very popular place. And I know they have great service, great food, and uh, obviously great selection of beers. Yeah, no question about it. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's a uh, former location of Bach Town. And it's uh, pretty close to Pool City and uh, right across the parking lot from Target. So I, I know everybody. Everybody knows what that is. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, Coach, uh, weekend split this past weekend. The Colonials, however, are off to one of the hottest starts in the Northeast Conference with a win-loss record of 3-1 and one in the league. And uh, you got the first two wins at home in conference play over two tough opponents, Fairleigh Dickinson University and Mount St. Mary's University. And uh, obviously getting off to a great jump start like that at home helped uh, propel you to a 3-0 record before uh, much longer. And uh, let's start with the first two when you open the season at home against those first two appoint, uh, uh, opponents since uh, we didn't ch chat about that next week. Yeah, I think uh, as, as we've talked about in, in some of the pregame and postgame shows, you know, the, the, the parity in the Northeast Conference is something that, you know, we haven't seen in, in a number of years. I mean, I think we've always been able to appoint to one or two teams that we thought were, you know, a little bit better than the rest. And if, if they stayed healthy, if things, you know, went their way, if they were able to play up to their potential, that they would, you know, be teams down the wire that would be, you know, in the top third of the league and would be, uh, you know, competing for regular season championships. This year, obviously, St. Francis PA was the team that was picked in the preseason poll to be first. Uh, FDU was picked second, and, you know, everybody else kind of fell after those two. Those two returned the most probably talent from last year's team, uh, the most experienced, the most postseason accolades. And so it makes sense for those two to be, you know, at the top from the preseason uh, perspective. But I think as this non-conference season has played out and you've seen, whether it's Wagner, Sacred Heart, uh, ourselves, whether you've seen the improvements that Bryant has made, uh, I think everyone's starting to realize that each and every game is going to be a dogfight and each and every game is going to come down to 
you know, just a couple possessions that, depending on how well you prepare or how well the ball bounces or whether you make or miss, could determine, you know, wins and losses. And our first four have certainly gone, you know, in that fashion. Uh, the first weekend being at home with FDU and in Mount St. Mary's, uh, you know, I thought we had an excellent performance against FDU, a uh, team with great size, great strength. Uh, and our front court really came through. Guys really stepped up. Charles Bain, Yanni Spendi, Malik Petway really led the game, led the way in that game, uh, leading us to a 69 to 62 win. I thought we had an excellent defensive effort that night. You know, really slowed down a couple of their key performers, Darnell Edge probably being uh, the one that we were able to limit the most. Uh, and then even score that we were able to. You know, really frustrating. Ivan Connell did a good job of frustrating him all night long. And, you know, we have such great respect for understand how good Darnell is. And, you know, to, to be able to slow him as we were, uh, we were fortunate. And so we were able to get that first win and then came out against Mount St. Mary's, who has a new coaching staff, almost entirely new roster, but in play, play incredibly hard and they're a very dangerous team. Uh, we played a good 17 minutes in that game, I would say. Uh, the last three minutes of the first half, I thought we started to relax and let our guard down some and give Mount St. Mary's credit. They pounced all over that. And we went from being uh, up 15 to up 11 and a half to down four with four to go. And, uh, you know, it was a great lesson for our guys in terms of playing every possession, playing a full 40 minutes regardless of score. And we were able to make some heroic plays to kind of pull that game out. Josh Williams with the game winning basket, followed by two important free throws against the three point lead. Uh, Kim Wilbon with some excellent play in the second half. You know, having 10 and 7 in, in for a freshman was really, really spectacular. He gave us a huge lift. And again, Yanni Smendi, Malik Petway getting on the backboards. Those guys uh, helped us total 18 offensive rebounds in that game. So, you know, our first week was successful, and they always talk about being able to defend your home court in conference play. And so far, we were able to do that. Uh, and I think uh, both games uh, in different fashion, but we were able to figure out ways to come out on top. Yeah, no doubt about it. And uh, a very cerebral, young head basketball coach told me recently it's very difficult to win a conference game, no matter where you are, home or away. And I think you told me that last week. You must be talking about somebody else because I'm not as young <laughs> as, I, as I used to be. Uh, I feel like uh, I'm aging in dog years. Uh, but um, it is. It's, it's really hard. And I think that, you know, you saw a lot of teams across the landscape of college basketball in that first week. And I, I remember. Now, Mike Gislino brought, brought to the team's attention a tweet before we went on the road to St. Francis, Brooklyn. And it was from a major uh, college basketball reporter, and he said, a lot of freshmen discovered how difficult conference basketball is, especially on the road this weekend. And it's true. You know, everybody knows what you're doing. You know personnel. Uh, there's no surprising anybody. There's no walking into a game and saying, well, this team's not going to be familiar with A, B, C, and D. They are. And so it's how well can you execute, how well can you prepare yourself mentally, and then how well can you go out and perform? Can you adjust? Can you adapt? Uh, can you find ways to win when you're not at your best? You know, we had, um, you know, some, some games already here in our first four where, you know, we haven't gotten great scoring from our backward. But we were able to find enough points, we were able to defend well enough to be able to come out on top. And I think that when you look across, when you break down seasons when they're all said and done, the teams that are able to win some of those games are usually the teams that are towards the top of the standings. And so, you know, hopefully we're, we're continuing to improve and learn and grow as, as the season goes on. But, uh, you know, the, the first two games at home and then even our first two road games this weekend, I think, uh, gave our guys really great perspective on how difficult conference basketball is. Absolutely. It's the Andy Tool Radio Show. We're live here at The Yard every Monday night in North Bay at Robinson. Chris Shovlin here with Coach Andy Tool. Uh, Coach, you said it uh, just a few moments ago. There are no secrets in basketball, particularly in conference basketball. Everybody knows everybody. Given that, how much does today's technology lend itself to how much knowledge coaching staffs have in preparing for an upcoming opponent? Well, it's, it's, um, it's so much more even than when I started coaching 13 years ago. You know, the, the access you have to film, the access you have to analytics, you know, the access you have to, you know, websites that will break down percentages out of, you know, a player's driving right, driving left, uh, percentage of shots they shoot from three, from two, at the rim, and how many of those are assisted. I mean, you can almost get 
uh, overload on, on some of the information. And so, you know, as a coach and as a coaching staff, you have to kind of compile as much information as you can that helps you paint the picture about how you want to be able to play and perform, how you want to execute, what things you need to be able to take away, right? You want to use the stats that guys are going to be able to understand, and you need to break them down in a way um, that can help them, help prove your point, right? It's almost like being a lawyer, you have to really build your case. Right? Why do we have to play hard for 40 minutes? Why do we have to let these guys have to affect the history of three? Why is it critical that we don't give this team second chance scoring opportunities? And there's enough data, whether it's film, whether it's numbers, that can support all that, that if everybody's paying attention, you can really devise a good plan and you can prepare your team. And our staff does an excellent job in their scouts. Uh, they do a really nice job of, of painting that picture, having a feeling, understanding, and these are the two or three keys that we really need to accomplish if we want to give ourselves the best chance to win. And then usually after the game, we can look back at those keys and say, okay, this is why we did win. This is why we were successful offensively. Hey, this is where we struggled, right? You know, we, we, we lost the game earlier this year to Seattle where in the ways they make 11 threes and we lost the big seven. Well, their game winning three and the three point loss was their 11 three of the game, right? And so those are things that even in a loss, you look back and you try to explain to your team that this is why it's so, so critical to be prepared. And it's so critical to be engaged in the film, in your scouting report, so that you go on the floor, you're able to execute the way that the team needs you to execute. Let me flip the coin on the question. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, we were talking about leading into the ball game, coming out of the ball game, and I noticed this traveling back uh, with the ball club this past weekend, the fact that uh, you were able to sit there on your iPad and go over individual circumstances with individual players uh, as we were traveling back from New York. Yeah, and that's the, you know, in the past, you know, you had the you know, VHS tape and then obviously burning DVDs and now you can really just upload games right to your iPad. I mean, our, our staff will walk out of a game and walk on a bus and get handed an iPad and that game will be on it. And, uh, you know, that just gives you such a great opportunity to grab your guys. I mean, you travel days everywhere, and you, know, you see the amount of time where you're sitting in a hotel or sitting in the airport, sitting on a bus, and, you know, there's a coach and two or three guys huddled around, kind of looking, watching. Um, and then the, the, the technology is so great where you can really almost frame by frame it so that guys can really see, you know, whether it's a footwork, whether it's a balance situation, whether it's um, just getting out of a defensive stance momentarily that caused them to be beaten. And, we have guys that want to, you know, eat that stuff up. I mean, I walked on the bus Saturday after LRU, and as John Williams got on the bus, he said, film, <laughs> excuse me, and, um, you know, I sat there for about, he walked in the back of the bus, I sat there for about 15 minutes, uh, checked my phone, checked some scores, took some deep breaths, you know, rubbed my ears and said, you saw a couple of times, and then texted him and said, you know, come on up, and, and we spent the next hour sitting there watching, really breaking down you know, our point guard play, really sitting there with him and saying, okay, freeze it right here. Why didn't you turn the corner here before? Hey, why didn't you see this? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you know, hey, defensively, you, you know, lean to the left when you really need an statement on. So all that stuff is just such a tremendous help for all these guys, and if they utilize it properly, can really help them in person. All right, as you can hear, uh, Coach Tool already has a midseason cold and cough, and uh, actually we're overcoming it right now, which is a good thing, and uh, that'll give us time to take a time out. So Colonials got off to a good start in NEC play this year, three and one after the first four ball games. Robert Morris, Wagner, and Sacred Heart all tied for the top spot right now. Central Connecticut State and Bryant are among five teams tied for the next spot at two and two right now in second place. And those are two of the teams that Robert Morris has to play this weekend. The others are St. Francis, Brooklyn, LIU, who they just came off of. St. Francis of Loretto. FDU is one and three. Mount St. Mary's is all and four. What have we learned about the NEC so far this year? Uh, we already talked about it. Every game is going to be wild. You know, um, you know FDU being at one and three is, I think, you know, really surprising with the level of talent that they have. And I have no doubt that they're going to get it together and, and probably go on a run at some point here during the conference season. They've lost 
you know, some really tough games, obviously our game, uh, and then they lost a crazy game with Central Connecticut State on uh, last Thursday night in double overtime in just crazy fashion. Uh, and then, you know, had to bounce back and play Saturday at Wagner, which is, you know, a really difficult place to win. We're down double digits early in that game, which is understandable because of the, you know, exhaustion by from Thursday night, and they came back and lost by six. So, uh, you know, that, that's something that, you know, kind of jumps out at you. Um, you know, I've watched Brian a couple times. Obviously, they had a new coach, Jared Grasso, and uh, their, their team is competing really hard. They're playing really well. Uh, they're really, uh, you know, defending at a high level. They're playing with a lot of passion that he's, you know, kind of provided them and, you know, kind of, kind of taking on his personality. So they're an improved team and at Sacred Heart, you know, they can really score. They're averaging almost 80 a game. Uh, they have a number of uh, young guys that are really capable of putting the ball in the basket. And uh, a couple guys that are on the team last year that have made really big jumps in their performance. And so, uh, Ken Latina has, has his team off to a good start. All right. Let's talk about the games uh, that Robert Morris is coming off of. Uh, if we can, let's start with St. Francis. Brooklyn is a, a really a gutted out win uh, when you get right down to it with the Terriers. 52 49. Robert Morris uh, ended up winning that ball game. And uh, again, you mentioned Gianni, uh, Gianni Smendi and Lee Petaway uh, coming up big most recently. They were the only two Colonials in double figures that particular night. And uh, just a grueling game. They were both. Yeah, for both ball clubs. It was, it was incredibly physical. Uh, you know, when you only score 52, it's hard to have a number of guys in double figures. But, uh, you know, we, we kept preaching those guys. Well, I, first and foremost, I think people have to understand that when you're playing St. Francis Brooklyn, not St. Francis Brooklyn, or anywhere, uh, in a park, uh, in a gym, in a neutral site, you know, at, on a Nerf loop, it's, it's hard to get buckets against those guys. I mean, they just, they've done it. You know, Glenn Brake has been there. Him and I are, you know, in our ninth year together. And, um, you know, you just, you, you're not going to get a lot of easy baskets. You're not going to get a lot of open shots. You're not going to get a lot of three-point opportunities against them. They they force everything into the basket. You know, they, they try and protect the rim. They deny like crazy. And so you've got to be able to have front court guys that can finish around the rim or guards that can finish strong at the rim. And, you know, Yannis and Malik, obviously, are both guys that can finish in the basket. And, uh, you know, so the, the game's going to be going, going right off the of bat. You know, and obviously we're a team that's, you know, trying to defend as hard as we can as well. And so, you know, you get a couple picks together, people are going to get muddy. And, and that's kind of what the game was like on Thursday night. It was, you know, uh, actually I thought, you know, when I went back and I watched the film, our first five or six shots of that game were, were some of the best shots we've got against St. Francis Brooklyn, I feel like, ever. Uh, and they, they didn't go in. And uh, sometimes that happens. And, you know, a lot of times when, when shots don't go in, I think guys have a, the, the tendency to maybe feel a little bit sad or maybe feel like, you know, woe's me. And our, our guys never did that, you know. And to be able to get to halftime down seven, uh, kind of regroup ourselves, talk about some adjustments we can make, uh, change some play calls out, continue to urge guys to, to defend. I mean, they only scored 25 in the first half themselves, so it wasn't like, you know, they were tearing the cover off the ball, but, uh, you know, we came out in the second half, we executed the throw, took really good shots. You know, key to it was that we all turned over nine times. Uh, really valued the ball. You know, we had a positive assist to turnover ratio against them, which is, is, is incredible. We shot, you know, 40% in the second half, so. Uh, we found just enough offense, just enough free throws, just enough offensive rebounds to make it work, and our defense really, you know, stood up and won us the game. And I told those guys afterwards in the locker room, you know, how proud I was of their effort, um, how much fun it was to see them compete the way that they did. You know, the, the, the communication between players during timeouts was was awesome. Uh, guys coming in the game were really locked in, ready to make adjustments, uh, really taking coaching in a, in a positive way, and you know, it made it a good experience. Obviously. And helped everyone won the game, but you know, I said if we would have lost that game by three, I, you know, I don't think it could have faulted anybody uh, necessarily. We, we hope that you make some more shots, maybe, or uh, that you, you, know, you get some cleaner looks. But you know, I, I thought we did. We tried to control everything that we could control, and uh, you know, I think that helped us get the win. Yeah. You're right about uh, you know missed shots often leads to a sag in defense, but not this time around. The defense was intense the entire game. Is that the best defensive game you played this year? I mean, it's, it's, it's up there. You know, I thought uh, I thought we did a really nice job against Jonestown State. I thought we did a really good, good defensive effort against Jonestown State. But, you know, I think for a full 40 minutes, uh, and, under the, and under the situations and circumstance, right, uh, being on national TV, you know, not 
scoring the ball well. You know, in that Youngstown State game, we scored the ball well, and sometimes that almost gives you some energy and some effort on the defensive side. This was the opposite. You know, we needed that defense to keep us in the game and, and keep us close to where we could figure it out. And uh, eventually, we were able to figure it out. And you know, it was really two big defensive plays by Malik Pat, right? that, that kind of gave us control of the game, a steal uh, for a breakaway dunk, and then a strip for a you know, hit headlight. And uh, you know, those were two, the two monster plays for us. And he and Yanis were playing on both ends of the court, just as uh, the rest of the Colonials were playing on both ends of the court, particularly on, on the defensive side. But those two guys really hit the glass on that game, and he set it up almost with a double double. He had nine rebounds. Yeah, Malik had six. Yeah, he's been he's been a terror here in this his conference season. And, uh, you know, he's got a nose for the ball. He's been great on the offensive glass. You know, he ended up with 17 offensive rebounds uh, in in the game. Uh, and there were a couple possessions that. You know, I mean, whether it was the Mount game or the San Francisco Brooklyn game, where Yanis is almost, you know, giving us hope and energy by the way he's rebounding the ball. And you know, we always talk about how many things that you can do in the game other than score to help your team win. And uh, Billy Donovan always talks about the 95%. And what he means by that is, you know, 95% of the game, you don't have the ball in your hand. And so what else are you doing for your team? And, and I think, you know, you've seen this year uh, us win some games on that 95%, whether it was, you know, some of the offensive rebounding Yanis had done, you know, Charles Bain getting a big offensive rebound uh, at the end of the St. Francis Brooklyn game, John Williams taking a charge, big time charge at the end of that St. Francis Brooklyn game, you know, Cam Wilbon with a loose ball save against Mount St. Mary's. You know, those, those kind of heady plays, you know, they add up during the course of the game. And uh, conversely, if you, you talk about the LIU Brooklyn game, you know, we went back and tracked it, and we didn't get any of the loose balls. You know, we just we didn't get the loose balls for whatever reason, you know, whether it was a lack of urgency, whether it was, you know, being a step slow, we, we didn't get the loose balls, and I think LIU did. I counted about 13 points in the first half, but I thought that, you know, we, you know, could have helped, you know, could have stopped them from getting, uh, and, and, and a lot of those were based on, you know, just some simple loose balls and some higher level of urgency that we had in those first three games. Just one more comment about the St. Francis Portland game, the win by Ronald Morris, uh, a little better way again, four steals and three blocks. You talk about that uh, you got percent when you don't have possession of basketball. He took possession of the basketball. He did. And again, those are the things that uh, we try to promote as much as we can in our program. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll call our guys out and you know, we rarely call the guy out that is the leading scorer in the game after the game. Uh, a lot of times we're talking about who took the charge, who dove on the floor, uh, you know, who, who had the deflection, who had, you know, the, the offensive rebound, you know, who had a great closeout. You know, those are the things I think that, you know, you've got to make sure that you're promoting within your, your team if you want to you know, kind of encourage that behavior. And so, you know, obviously you guys score to win, don't get me wrong, but uh, you don't have to really encourage anybody to score. A lot of times everybody's ready, willing, and able to take shots and score the ball. It's, you know, you know, they do some of those little things that really can change the course of the game. Let's talk about the difference between the win on St. Francis Brooklyn and then nine blocks away falling at LIU. What were the differences? Uh, I'll say differences because there were probably a few uh, between the, the, the win and the loss on the road. Well, if you, if you break down the details of it, you know, it, it, there's there's a number of things, but I think, you know, if you want to give the general answer, we didn't defend. You know, we didn't defend the way that we're capable of. You know, they shot 60% for the game, uh, 65% in the second half. And we just didn't have the communication, we didn't have the urgency. You know, all night long, we seemed to be just as slow. On the defensive side of the floor, obviously we scored 73, we made 10 threes, uh, you know, we were out at the half, but we didn't guard, we didn't come up with the stops, we didn't even come up with the stops, and, you know, Ray Paul Clark and Jay Sean Abesto are two really talented guys in our league, uh, Ray Paul and Andrew both at 21 points a game, and, you know, Jay Sean, a junior now, you know, kind of made himself known to us his freshman year in the, in the Northeast Conference tournament, a uh, game that we were able to win, but was, you know, quite a performance on, on his end, um, but, you know, we just weren't able to defend. We weren't able to come up with the stops that we needed to come up with. Those two guys combined for 45 or uh, and we just were steps on the defensive side. And it was something that we talked about too about today as we got back together for practice. But that was the main thing. You know, we just, you know, our turnover number crept up again. They got a ton of points.
12 or 4 turnovers. And sometimes in order to play good defense, you have to play good offense. If you're taking bad shots or you're heavy, giving the ball away, you're increasing your opponent's ability to, to score, get high percentage plays. And for a team like LIU that's great in transition, you know, we gave them way too many opportunities of them taking our own ball. Uh, that really cost us 30 push that ball. All right. Uh, just to follow up that at the, the maturity level of this ball club is uh, maybe higher than some of the clubs that you've had in 30 years. And again, I'll bring up the fact that John Williams gets on the bus and says, don't take it. I don't know why. Uh, I think that's a great testament to John, and there are others on this ball club who also want to look into not only the successes, but for the failures to play by play. Yeah, we, we haven't had any issue all year with um, you know, guys you know, wanting to try and get better, uh, wanting to try and figure it out. Now, going out and executing it isn't always easy either, right? Um, and we've got you know, Yanis Mendy, who is probably as professional you know, a kid as we've had in the program. You know, he obviously has had experience playing uh, for club teams in Europe. You know, he basically moved away from home when he was 13, 14 years old to really pursue the game of basketball. And so he's, you know, whether it's working with Jason Daly, our trainer, whether it's with Dennis Couture, our strength coach, whether it's coming in to watch film, whether it's coming in to get extra shots, you know, he sets a great tone for the rest of our team in the way that he works. If he has a bad practice, all of a sudden you hear that ball bounce in 25, 30 minutes after practice, he's out there working on his finish. He's out there working on his free throws. He's out there working on his football. John Williams is the same way. Josh Williams is the same way. Charles Bain is the same way. Dante Tracy. You know, they're guys that really uh, are in tune and they want to be successful. They want to play well. They, they care about, you know, how they perform. Um, the league's been great. You know, we've been coming in watching film with Mike Gazzolino now uh, for for, uh, you know, the, the last you know, couple months after games and really for trying to figure out, you know, how we can do more and how we can do better. And, you know, when you have guys doing that, you know, as coaches, you love it. You love the opportunity to get those guys in the gym. You love the opportunity to have them in the office so that you can kind of see some of the improvements and then you can build on it and say, hey, this is what we're talking about. This is exactly the footwork we want you to have, the positioning we want you to have. And so, you know, those guys have all been really, really good with it. And, you know, Malik and Yanni, you see, Kim Wilbon and Dante Tracy are kind of going through some of this for the first time. Say, you know, Kim going through some of this for the first time. So, you know, we're trying to teach them as we go uh, and making sure that they're coming in and seeing themselves because, you know, as, as much as we all think we know what we're doing, that film doesn't lie. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really good to give yourself an opportunity to kind of honestly evaluate and sit there with a coach and you can learn and learn. All right, we go for a timeout. We're listening to the coach Andy Toll Radio Show. We're talking about the boys basketball. We're live at the yard here in the North Bay at Robinson area as we are each and every Monday night, with the exception of next week. Next week's show, because as long as we're on the road at Central Connecticut State on Martin Luther King Jr. Day, will be held on Wednesday. But here, typically on Monday nights at the yard in North Bay, I'm Chris Shuffle with Coach Tool. We'll take this time out. Back with the 2019 version of Tool Off the Court. Coming up next, right here on ESPN. Here we are. Everybody's going to wait on Art Radio at Keyword RMU. That's what I'm going to pause on. Special weekly feature that we have uh, for Coach Tool, uh, trying to get a lap and actually trying to get our producer, Tom Hoffman, to fall off of his chair back in the studios from time to time. Have we done that yet? Have we gotten close to that yet? I don't know. I've been playing with Tom Giggle in the background from yeah. time to time during these shows. But uh, yeah, I, I think a few people have dropped off of their seats uh, over, over some of the topics that we brought up. And uh, I, I don't know if this is going to knock Tom off his chair tonight, but. Uh, uh, we will start by asking Andy Tool the uh, Rocky questions that uh, this segment of the show uh, has been uh, has been indicted for. Correct. Now, for the years. I, I, I would think that that's a proper way of putting it. Mm -hmm. uh, these are things that have nothing to do with basketball and everything to do with Andy Tool and his opinions. Uh, first, this actually does have something to do with on the court. Who's your favorite Kardashian? <laughs> Well, wasn't Kendall at our Drexel game? She was. Kendall Jenner was at our Drexel game uh, in Philadelphia just about a month ago, and that's I, I guess that's why I needed to ask you that question first. Well, she's probably the least favorite, because if she was at the game, I can't believe that I haven't heard from her yet. Um, <laughs> I mean, I know she's hanging with Ben Simmons, but uh, maybe she Googled me and realized that I'm married to Brooks, so she probably decided to you know, stay away. Uh, well, that, 
Kardashian doesn't have a chance. <laughs> Correct. Um, I, I can't say that I have a favorite Kardashian. I'll be honest. Uh, I think all of them are uh, pretty hard to swallow. I have binge watched a couple Keeping Up with the Kardashians at points in my life that I'm not happy to admit to, uh, especially in public. But uh, I, I really can't say that I have a favorite. Okay. Campbell is top of mind. Well, she's least favorite because she was at the game. But she was at the game, and she's hang, she's hanging out with Maddie McConnell's brother, too. She it's is. not just Ben Simmons. Correct. Yeah, that, 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 that's true. I don't know. Did Maddie get to meet her? Did we ask him that? You know what? I have to I have to ask him. I don't know. I'm guessing that she booked out of the, out of the arena before Maddie got out of the shower. I can't imagine he would hit her with any anything smooth if he did get a chance to talk to her either. <laughs> I'd like to know what he hit her with that. Hey, Kendall, this is Maddie. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's probably about the depth of it. Well, she knows him, yeah. so yeah. That, that's important because TJ was there. Uh, he and Ben Simmons, of course, with his uh, 76ers. You mentioned binge watching. What's the last thing that you binge watched, or did you binge watch anything over the summer in particular that you want to talk about? You know what I binge watched recently is um, the show Luther on Netflix. Have you heard is of it? Is that the one about Bill Luther? It is not. Uh, that's actually in production. Um, but uh, this is the uh, about John Luther. It's uh, it's a BBC show. Uh, Idris Elba is uh, a detective, and it's it's only like six or seven episodes. But uh, I got through it pretty quick. Really interesting show. That that's the last thing that I binge watched. He's, he's a great actor, great actor, tremendous actor. But that's it's not about Bill Luther. I only say that because Bill's sitting right across from us here tonight. What about the last book that you read? Did you read a book over the summer during the off season at all? I started a number of books. I don't think I finished any of them. Um, I've got. I, mean, I, I kind of like usually have like two or three books going, and I kind of jump back and forth. Uh, Insight by Tasha Yurik is the last book that I that I completed, and I think that was uh, spring summertime. Uh, I started on the Culture Code, uh, which is by Daniel. Uh, what's his name? Daniel Coyza. I don't know. I don't know. But don't he, look at that table. He does none of these guys. Yeah, he wrote the Talent Code, and then he, and then he wrote the Culture Code. So those, those are kind of the books that I'm reading. I don't really read any books that are like, uh, you know, Tom Clancy or James Patterson or uh, any any like just novels. I don't, I don't really read for that fashion. Usually I'm reading, you know, Above the Line by Seth Davis or, you know, some, some kind of coaching, uh, management, uh, self-help kind of book to try and, you know, just gather some ideas or insight on. You know, how to make our team better. Okay. Topic is uh, what you do over the summer over the over the basketball break. I know you spent part of that basketball break. When's the basketball break? I, I, I know for you there is no such. Is that a different uh, part of the year that I'm not aware of? I guess you know you're not aware of it, but some of the others in, in, involved here in the room, we have a break when there is no basketball for us. Although we, we think about you all. The time. Thank you. There's no question about that. I appreciate it. What about uh, over the summer, any movies that you saw? Did, uh, did you have to take the guys to the movies or Movies. You know what I saw uh, two weeks ago was Mary Poppins Returns. Did you? I did. And uh, my mom's all-time favorite movie, she's probably listening, is is the original Mary Poppins. That's like her go-to movie. Julie Andrews, Dick Van Dyke. Yeah, Wars. correct. Uh, seen it a number of times. And uh, so we brought Ryan and Colin, we, we, we brought Ryan and Colin to see it probably uh, maybe a couple Fridays ago, during uh, in between Christmas and New Year's week. Uh, and I hadn't been to the movies in a long time. The movie theater that's over here in Sellers Ridge, yeah. I mean, it, it could have been your, it could have been like your TV room. I mean, literally, I, I got a, a, a beer, and, and like the, the chair reclines like all the way back, and it was like, you get to pick your seats. Yeah. I didn't even know that was part of the movies. I thought you usually have to get there early to like find good seats, but no, that was all taken care of for you. Uh, and Mary Poppins Returns was actually excellent. I, uh, I thought they did a really good job with the movie, and it ties into the original very well. And uh, Dick Van Dyke was in this one too. He was. Emily Blunt is excellent as, as Mary Poppins. Uh, so if you have uh, young kids or you just like Disney movies, I would recommend it. If you're tuning in to 970 AM or 106.3 FM or the iHeartRadio app, keyword RMU, I'm wondering the hell are we talking about? <laughs> this is supposed to be a sports station. This is Tool off the court. We ask Andy Tool uh, questions uh, about stuff other than basketball during his radio show each and every week here on ESPN Pittsburgh. How about, uh, you know, during what we call the basketball break, you, you never have a break from basketball, but over the summer, uh, did you run into any old friends anywhere? 
along the line. Any old friends anywhere along the line? Well, I was at the Jersey Shore for a week in June, so... So I figured you might run into yeah. someone, you know? I ran into a lot of people when I was there. I made some time to see some, some friends, high school friends, some of friends, uh, some college guys that are still in that area. Um, over Christmas, I was able to run into some people as well. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think you're always you know, trying to stay as connected as you can to as many people as possible. And it's not as easy as it used to be, so when you can kind of carve out a little bit of time to do that stuff, I think it's, uh, it's really special. I think most people familiar with uh, the basketball program know that you took them to Ireland on the first ever uh, trip abroad for a Robert Morris University basketball team, and it was uh, it was a remarkable trip. And I need to ask you, uh, what was the favorite place you visited while you were on the Emerald Emer Line? Well, I mean, the Cliffs of War were amazing. I mean, I think that was probably the you know from a just wow factor you know that was uh, amazing I mean, we, we couldn't get our guys off the cliffs I mean, it was uh, they were literally hanging over the edge it was an it's, it was an Instagram photo shoot for the for the ages uh, I mean people's IGs were just you know blowing up and the more daring and closer to the cliffs you could get I guess the more likes you get maybe I don't really know how all that works but um, you know we, we couldn't get them off we were like herding them back to the bus and they were trying to, you know, take a picture of us saying, well, let me kneel down this way, let me do this. And it was, it, I mean, it was fun to see, I, I will say that. Um, so that was that was probably the most uh, breathtaking um, thing that, that we saw. Uh, I thought the Aran Islands were awesome. I thought that was really cool to kind of get, take the ferry over and then get dropped off and there's sheep and, you know, uh, horses walking amongst you as you kind of walk into this town. Not to mention the byproduct in the streets. Yeah, correct. Uh, you to keep an eye out for that. But, you know, there's... Um, you know, a couple hundred year-round residents on this island. And, you know, where in our lives do we ever encounter, you know, situations like that? And of course, of course, in, in, in you know, small world theory, the place that we had lunch that day, the lady was from New Jersey. So, yeah, she was from New Jersey. She went to the same high school that uh, my mom attended, obviously at different times. And her and her husband and their family moved over and they started this restaurant. And so it just always goes back to New Jersey, really, I think, is what, what we're getting at. The center of the world, no question about that. Just a couple of other points. Uh, again, there were several tours that we went on. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, ask you to compare and contrast. Did you prefer James, the Jameson tour or the Guinness tour? Jameson tour, by far. Uh, I don't think it was even close. I think that the... Is this going in uh, uh, Zagat's uh, tour guide? I think it might be. He might be uh, maybe Yelp. I can get this out on Yelp. <laughs> um, I thought that the Jameson tour was much more personalized, much more informative. You know, the, the Guinness was more of a self-guided museum tour. And uh, I really felt like... You didn't, you didn't get a chance to really fully enjoy all of the exhibits and all of the information because it, once you got in, you almost had to kind of keep pace with as everybody walked. And so, you know, as everybody kind of kept moving, you just had to keep moving. And it was, you know, you almost felt like a salmon swimming upstream if you wanted to stop in certain areas and read a little bit more or whatever. But, you know, the Jameson was private tours. Um, up to 30 or 40 people, and so you can really you know, get into the, the history of Jameson, and I just I thought they did a really good job. I thought both places were awesome. I thought the Guinness Brewery and the Jameson Brewery were really, really cool uh, and well-designed and decorated places, uh, but the Jameson tour I thought was much better. All right, finally tonight, you mentioned swimming upstream. Shepherd's pie or salmon? Salmon. I don't like the shepherd's pie. I mean, you don't go over there for the food. I mean, we were in Kinsale, which was the culinary capital of, of Ireland, but it all seemed like pretty good American food to me. It didn't seem like there was uh, crazy cuisine, but salmon is super good. It was well, incredible because the, the, the most crowded place in Kinsale was a, a fish and chips bar. Yeah, exactly. Couldn't get in. Yep. We were out the street. Anyway, that'll do it for Tool of the Court here uh, on the Andy Tool Show. Stay tuned. We're going to come back and set you up for this coming weekend. You want to register to win two front row tickets to see Robert Morris basketball in the 1921 club seating. Or if you want to win some Nerf hoops and balls and other goodies, we have some stuff here that we're giving away. All you need to do is come up to the front table uh, where we're broadcasting from and fill out a registration coupon. And uh, we'll see if we can make you a winner here tonight.
Speaking of making you aware, that's what the Colonials want to be this weekend as uh, they have an extra couple of days off before they uh, resume Northeast Conference play as they take on the Bryant Bulldogs on Saturday at Central Connecticut State on Monday for an MLK Day special. Coach, let's talk about getting the team back out on the road. Of course, uh, this is a, a four-game road swing in all. You split the first two. You've got to get out there and try to get two in the, in the wing column this weekend. Let's talk about how to get it. Yeah, and we'll go with the old coach speak. You know, obviously we got to just go one at a time, and, and that's you know really all that we can we can handle right now. And, uh, you know, it's it's obviously a little bit of a different week. This is this is when we kind of get into our routine, which I like. Uh, now playing uh, Saturday and Monday instead of Thursday, Saturday kind of changes our week. Uh, it'll be interesting to kind of see the following week when we go Thursday, Monday, Thursday, uh, sorry, Saturday, Monday, Thursday, Saturday. Um, and it'll be interesting to kind of see how everybody shakes out, you know, once once that occurs. But, um, you know, we're, we're heading up Friday morning to Brian, hopefully get out of here before the snow starts, get up there, get ourselves settled, and, um, you know, start to prepare for a good Bryant team. I mean, uh, like we said, we have some guys that we know in the town, Sebastian Towns, Adam Grant, guys that we've talked about through the years that are really effective players. Uh, they had a coaching change in the offseason with Jared Grasso, long time. Uh, Iona assistant has become their, their head coach. And he's a guy who played in the Northeast Conference. Played at Quinnipiac, uh, graduated from Quinnipiac in 2002 or 2003. He's, he's uh, about my age. And, you know, he's been an assistant in Hartford, he was an assistant at Fordham, he's been on coach for a year at, at Fordham. Uh, you know, a year after, I think, a year or two after we had beat them there. Uh, but, you know, he, Jared does a good job. He's got his team competing. Uh, you know, he's still, you know, I think, uh, you know, trying to you know, change the culture there, get the guys in that, you know, he wants. He's, he's got some of the guys that are left over in there playing hard. And, uh, you know, they beat St. Francis Brooklyn at their place. They beat, they won at the mound. They're 2-2 two two right now. And, you know, they're a team that's, uh, you know, trying to prove trying to prove their work and uh, it'll, be, it'll be a challenge and you know, we'll get to the State uh, who is, uh, has one of the you know, best players in the league, Tyler Cole, who's an all-league player from last season. Uh, Daniel Marshall in his, in his third year there and now he's got even more of his own guys on that roster and uh, you know they're, they're two and two as well and I think every game they go into is going to be you know, one or two possessions. Uh, these will be no different and so we got to make sure that we're really you know, connected and, and, and together as we go out on the road for these, these, uh, these next two. Yeah, you mentioned coach speak, but it, it is true. One game at a time. That's the way you have to take it. Yeah, it really is. I mean, I, I don't think that uh, anybody, any coach you talk to, you know, ever really looks any further than, than the game that they're have next. You know, obviously, you have know, assistants that are, you know, assistants that scouting that Central Connecticut State game and, you know, kind of monitoring and watching them. And, uh, you know, I've seen bits and pieces and obviously familiar with some of the personnel from, from past seasons, but, you know, you really have to keep the focus as small as humanly possible. And even today in practice, we didn't talk about Brian, we didn't talk about Central Connecticut State, we talked about Bob Morris and what we need to do to get better, things we need to improve on. And, you know, that's what we tried to attack today. Uh, tomorrow, with it being a little bit of a different week, you know, we'll probably do a, have a little bit of a lighter workout tomorrow, a shooting workout, and then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, really install game plan for Saturday. And you know, we've got to make sure we continue to compete, we continue to push ourselves so that we continue to improve. I think you know, the one thing we did talk to the team about today in terms of time of year is the teams at this point in the year that continue to attack their weaknesses, we continue to have competitive practices will continue to improve as the year goes on. And, uh, you know, I think there's sometimes that, that teams or players feel like once you get a conference play, it's kind of like a day and you just kind of repeat every week. Well, you know, each week we've got to continue to attack and improve the things that, you know, we're, we're maybe deficient at. So, you know, we, we looked at our, our last two games and our first four conference games and, you know, we tried to build a practice plan that would help us improve in some of those areas. And, uh, you know, that's that's kind of what our focus is, trying to make each day right. You know, a couple of guys had some good ones today. We had a few guys that had some bad ones. And, you know, one of the, one of the guys uh, who didn't fight as well as we would have liked, you know, I was talking to him afterwards, and I said, you just got to make each day right. You have to try and take that day and make it right. Give your best effort, give your best focus, have your best attitude so that you can, you can get better. And if you can stack some of those days, then all of a sudden, you know, good things will happen for you and good things will happen for the team. 
All right, that's pretty much going to do it for tonight. So we have uh, cataloged uh, two shows, and we're moving ready for January. It's hard to believe it's ticking away. You know, a show that's like riding a bike. I mean, we haven't done this in about 10 months, and here we are again, just, you know, falling right back into the old routine. Having a good old time. And we'll do it next Wednesday, next week. The Andy Tool Show will be back here at the yard of our fan. Meanwhile, two games uh, this weekend, Brian, Saturday and Central Connecticut State on Monday. Both games will be live right here on ESPN. It's 